Good morning, Walden Church, and Merry Christmas. That's right, Merry Christmas. This is the very first week of Advent. I know it feels like we just had Thanksgiving. We're still in November, but this is the first of the four Advent series. And uh, this week, I have been asking my family, what movie is a must watch at Christmas time? For you, okay, for you, what is a, a Christmas movie that it just doesn't feel like Christmas until you watch it. Like every year you say, I have to watch it. Uh, mine has kind of always been a toss up between Christmas Carol with Patrick Stewart and Jingle All the Way <laughs> with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, so if you're somebody in the room with you right now, turn to your neighbor and let them know what your favorite Christmas movie is. Just say it out loud. Just say, hey, my favorite movie is this. Um, Dermot, my youngest, his favorite is Polar Express. We just uh, watched it last night. Uh, my wife, Joanna, uh, her favorite movie is Elf. And Peggy, my mother-in-law, said that hers was It's a Wonderful Life. Now, I mentioned A Christmas Carol, and it probably would not surprise you that that movie has been remade right? There are multiple versions of it at least 20 times. 20 times. Miracle on 4th Street has been remade four times. Even Christmas in Connecticut was remade once. Do you know which Christmas movie has never been remade? It's a Wonderful Life. The only reason I can figure is you just don't mess with a classic. Certain stories are classics and you just don't tamper with them. And I would think the same could be said about our Christmas story that's in the Bible, the nativity, right? You just don't mess with it, it's a classic. This Christmas story is repeated, it's told in Sunday school classes, it's made into movies, it's made into picture books, there's pop-up books, the images from that story are on Christmas cards, and all of the elements of that story are very well known to Christians. The birth of Jesus' life had three wise men bearing gifts, shepherds in the field in midwinter, a baby born in a stable, and a sign that read, no room in the inn. All of these facts, they are firmly affixed in our minds. But is this the story? Is that the classic story? Is this how the story actually plays out in the Bible? This is what I want to talk about for the next few weeks. Really examine the Christmas story and strip away all of the extra stuff that's been piled on top of it. I don't want to mess with a classic, but I think I want to rediscover the classic that's underneath. What's the truth behind what happened? Not the, not the little drummer boy truth or the innkeeper's truth, the biblical truth, the God's honest truth about Christmas. Why? Well, because truth is good and truth is light. I want to ask what we know about the story and then compare it with what we know about people. Because I think we look at these stories from the outside in so much that we forget that the people in the Bible were people just like you and me. Joseph is a brand new dad. Mary is a young, new mom. And so what happens to the story if we read it from the understanding that this isn't a Christmas movie? This is true. Friends, this is a true story. Christmas is a celebration of a true event. You know, we add trees and tinsel and shiny ornaments to it. We hang garland on it. And no matter where you live in the world, we always sing songs about snow and winter. But this Christmas story is history. So let's look at the true story of Christmas. For our study, we will be in the book of Luke. Luke opens his story with a short introduction, and I think it's important to us. Verse 1 says, Many people have already applied themselves to the task of compiling an account of the events that have been fulfilled among us. They used what the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed down to us. Now, after having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, I have also decided to write a carefully ordered account for you, most honorable Theophilus, 
I want you to have confidence in the soundness of the instruction you have received. The book of Luke is written in perfect Greek. There are over 700 Greek words that appear in Luke that don't appear anywhere else in the Bible. What does that mean? Well, it means Luke knows a lot of fancy words, right? <laughs> what do we know about Luke? We know that Luke was a physician, right? He's a doctor. In the book of Colossians, Paul calls Luke our dear friend and doctor. So that means that Luke is educated. And notice what Luke says. He says, now after having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, I have also decided to write a carefully ordered account for you. Luke is a doctor, he knows a lot of fancy words, and he writes with perfect diction. And he says, he's gonna write a careful and orderly account using investigation and using eyewitnesses. Now, if you don't know any of the stories that we are about to read, and you were just you know, oblivious, and you, you said, oh, I've never heard the Christmas story before, and you had just read Luke's introduction for the very first time, would you think that a story about a Middle Eastern teacher written by a doctor <laughs> would be a bestseller? Do you think that'd be a good story? Does that sound like a gripping story? Would this be a book that would hold your interest? Probably not. But at the same time, would you at least entertain the idea that the story was true? Doctors are interested in details, about facts, numbers, and Luke is living in a time when he can still investigate the story. He's living in a time where there are still eyewitnesses, many of whom he will meet, and we will meet, as we read the story. And Luke begins with the preface that this story is true. Luke says these things actually happened. But as careful as Luke is to tell this Christmas story, you and I, we still come away with our own version in our heads. Many times we will remember parts of this story that never happened. How is that possible? Well, for instance, why do we think that Mary rode on the back of a donkey through a barren, hot desert? Why do we think that Mary gave birth in a cave? Why do we picture the holy couple alone without aid, and treated so poorly by the townspeople and the innkeeper? Why is there a little drummer boy in your nativity scene? Well, because the Christmas story, for most of us, is shaped by other influences, other stories, pictures, art, and all of that is outside of the Bible. For instance, when we think of the trip that Joseph and Mary take, I think we always picture the holy couple trekking through a desert while Mary sits on the back of a donkey. But the truth is, the Gospels never mention a donkey, and the road between Jerusalem and Bethlehem is not hostile territory at all. It's actually very rich farmland. So what I want to do in this series is really take a look at the text and talk about the actual story, what we know to be true, and then we can extrapolate using understanding that these are real people. These are real people in real situations. You ready to go? Luke 2 verse 1 says, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. Caesar Augustus is Gaius Octavius. He was born in 63 B.C. He is the first emperor of Rome. His mom was the niece of Julius Caesar, and later Julius Caesar adopted Gaius as his own son and heir. And at 18 years old, Augustus was declared a god of the Roman Empire. Augustus would later uh, begin a political campaign called the Pax Romana, or the Roman Peace. And as emperor, Augustus ruled for 41 years. He built Rome into a strong sovereignty. He established uh, standardized government. He created border security. He created the postal service. He created paper money. He created a police and fire department. He created a legal system. He built roads and bridges and aqueducts and many, many buildings. He even 
restored old, dilapidated places of worship. Augustus, as Luke tells us, is also the reason why Mary and Joseph are making this journey. Augustus has ordered a census, and this is important because at that time, the Jews here, they are an oppressed people group. And a census is a nice way of making sure that everyone pays their tax. But it kind of also reminds people who's the boss. The emperor has the power to disrupt your life. And he can make you travel great distances. And this decree, it isn't fun. And even for Jews, uh, this would feel very defeating. And so it's into this very corrupt, very confusing time in this obscure corner of the empire, we have this nondescript couple coming to Bethlehem in obedience to a decree by an emperor. And the entire earth-shattering event of Jesus' life, his birth, right here, it's recorded in Luke in these next four verses. Verse 5 says, And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. No room in the inn. That's a very Christmas story, right? Very, you, we can picture it, right? And I think in our heads, we picture the couple trying to find a place to stay and being turned away by these flashing no vacancy signs. But is that what the Bible says? The word in, in our verse, is the word katalmaya in the Greek. And Luke actually uses katalmaya in another place in the gospel. Particularly, he uses it in the Last Supper. Luke 22, this is where Jesus says, and tell the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Notice that the same word for in that Luke uses earlier gets translated in a different place as guest room. And to continue this same line of thought, there is a place where Luke does in fact write about an inn, which is the story of the Good Samaritan. And in that parable, the beaten man is taken to an inn where his wounds are dressed. And in that story, Luke uses an entirely different word, pandoxion. So I think, and many Bible translators agree with me, that if Luke meant an inn, he would have used that word. But he uses the word for guest room in the Christmas story. And I think once you read the story with the word guest room, the story makes a lot more sense. Because remember, this is a true story. It is a story that consists of real people in real situations, and we need to look at what the Bible says and then use common sense. So let's go back and take a look at a few things. Verse 4 says, Joseph also went out from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. What does that mean? That means Joseph is returning to his hometown. And this is what is important for us to know, okay? In the Middle East, historical memory is very long. And the truth is, if Joseph had rolled into town, he probably could have stayed anywhere he wanted. He could just say, I am Joseph, son of Eli, son of Athat, son of Levi. And people would have been able to trace his lineage. They would know that he was a child of Bethlehem and any door would have been open to him. Second, Joseph is kind of royalty because he's from the family line of David. That would be King David. And that's important because he's going to the city of David. Jesus is being born in the same city where David grew up. So Joseph has a strong and very influential family in town and his roots can be traced all the way back to the king of that town. So if he's coming into town at any hour, he could have had his pick of homes to stay in. Verse 5 says that he was to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And here is where we picture the couple going door to door, trying to find a place to stay, and then doors being slammed in their face. Was it a shameful thing 
that Mary was pregnant and that they were only engaged and not married. Eh, I mean, yes and no. But was it so shameful that people would throw these two out into the cold? Hardly. I think in every culture, a woman who is about to give birth, this is a very special situation, and it requires attention regardless of morality. Even in simple cultures, other women in the village will help a woman give birth, especially a young woman who is pregnant for the first time. So are we to assume that the entire town of Bethlehem is full of rude and uncaring people? We just throw a young girl about to give birth out into the street. I mean, if that were truly the case, it would have brought great shame on this town. Leviticus 19 says, when a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. If this is a true story about real people, then I don't believe for a second that a culture and a people who pride themselves in hospitality and caring for the disenfranchised would turn away a young pregnant mother. How quickly do you see people give up their seat to a pregnant lady just so that she can sit down? I hardly think that Mary and Joseph were cast aside so carelessly. And here's another important fact that, you know, we just got through saying Joseph would have had relatives in Bethlehem. Well, Mary had relatives that lived close by also. Before this story, when Mary gets the news that she's pregnant, Mary goes to visit Elizabeth, who lives in the hill country of Judea, right? Well, Bethlehem is in the center of Judea. So by the time Mary and Joseph get to Bethlehem, if every door was truly close to them, they could have pushed on just a little further and stayed with Mary's relatives. So, I mean, let me, oh, let me just talk to the guys in the room, okay, just for a second. So you ladies, you can, you know, hang on. Guys, gentlemen, let's say your wife is about to pop, okay? She's gonna give birth, and you have two options. <laughs> your wife gives birth in a barn with cows. Okay, that's option one. <laughs> or two, you push on another mile or so so that you can stay in a nice warm bed with relatives. What would you have done? But here's where our, our recollection of the Christmas story kicks in and we think, yeah, but they didn't have time, right? They didn't have time. Didn't Mary give birth the same night they pulled into town? I don't know. Is that what the Bible says? Or is that just how we remember it? The Bible says in verse 6, while they were there, the time came for Mary to have her baby. Does that sound like it happened suddenly? Or the very same night? Not necessarily. It says while they were there, the time came. I assume if Luke were writing a factual account, if this were a sudden or unexpected thing, then he would have mentioned it. But the words he uses are very casual. In fact, let's just assume that this is a true story with real people. Joseph is a man who, A, knows his wife is pregnant, <laughs> and he also probably knows how far along she is. B, he would have known how long it would take for them to make the trip. C, he would have known that they both had relatives and friends who lived close. So what would we assume that he would do? He would have a plan, right? Come on, he would have a plan. Most of us believe that the couple rolls into town with no plan and, and that Mary had her baby that very same night in the only place they could find. And if that was the case, what would that have looked like? Mary and Joseph pull into town and they start driving around slowly looking for a vacancy sign and Mary looks slyly over at her husband and says, whoa, 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 whoa. I told you about this months ago. Don't tell me we just walked 80 miles for almost a week and you didn't call ahead to make reservations. Shh, no, 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 no. I, I can figure this out. Just call your sister, we can stay with her. I told you, she still hates me after what happened with last, at last Thanksgiving. Well, give me the phone and I'll, I'll call my cousin. Is that what we think happened? I don't. And nothing in the Bible implies that they were rushed or desperate 
or that they didn't have a plan. I think we are dealing with rational, intelligent people who had time to plan. And Joseph would have made a plan. So that brings us back to the whole inn versus guest room debacle. What are we talking about? Well, most first century homes consisted of two levels. You had two large open rooms. You had an upstairs and a downstairs. The upstairs was for sleeping, and that's where your guest would stay. This is called the upper room, and it's where we see Jesus have his last supper. The downstairs was a common area where all the living and the cooking takes place. This would be the family room. At the end of the living room, next to the front door, is a smaller room. It's a few feet lower than the house, and every night the family cow or the family donkey was brought inside and placed in that small room. And then every morning those animals were taken and led outside into a courtyard. Now, why would you bring your animals inside at night? Well, there's a couple reasons. Well, first, most homes in Bethlehem are middle-class families. And the truth is, you don't just have a lot of property to allow your uh, animals to roam free or that they could have their own barn. Growing up, my dog never had even had a dog house. At night, the dog comes indoors, and in the morning, you let him out. Same thing. Second, if you did leave your animals outside at night, you're taking the chance that someone could steal it. If you have your only source of milk or your only source of wool stolen, that would be devastating to your family. Third, there's another very valuable attribute to bringing your animal in at night. Central heating. <laughs> The body heat from the first floor animals would transfer and it would fly up and it would heat the upstairs room. And then in the morning, you could use the hay that they used and their animal dung to burn and to make fuel. Verse 7 says, And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the guest room. So that word manger... That's the only place in the entire story where we think that Mary and Joseph stayed in a cave or in a barn or in a half-structured shelter lean-to that had no front door. But remember, the Bible doesn't say. And as soon as we read the story with the word guest room instead of in, then we can extrapolate an entirely different story. Doesn't it seem more plausible that Joseph was intelligent and he knew how far along his wife was. And he made plans when they got into his hometown. That when they arrive at the home of where they had planned to stay, the entire upstairs was already full of travelers. So that same home allowed Mary some privacy and they gave her the stable room. Then Mary had her baby after a few days. And that, when she did, the women of that house helped in the delivery because she wasn't just going to fend for herself. In fact, look at what verse uh, 16 and 17 says about the shepherds. And they, the shepherds, went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. We're applying rational thought to Mary and Joseph and the birth. Okay? Let's apply that same rational thought to the shepherds. Okay? If Mary and Joseph were truly left in a cold barn, alone, and they had no one to help them, wouldn't these shepherd men, who had just been told by angels that a king had been born, wouldn't they have seen the horrible conditions that Mary and Joseph were in and helped them? Would they have looked at that little stable, lean-to, structure, shelter, and said, oh, how picturesque, right? No. Wouldn't a normal, rational person have said, oh my goodness, you had a baby in these conditions? Please come to our homes. Come to our homes. Our women will take care of you. You can have our beds, Right? Instead, the story says they run off praising God. I think we have to assume since the shepherds were announcing good news, that means they were comfortable leaving Mary and Joseph in the conditions that they were in. Plus, if we just jump out of Luke for only a second and we go to the account that's in Matthew, 
It says, Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. What does the Bible clearly say about where Mary and Joseph are? They are in a house. And believe me, I'm not trying to shatter anyone's beautiful picture or ruin anyone's Christmas song or their Christmas play. You don't have to go home and smash your nativity set. But I am suggesting that nobody was hurried. Nobody was turned away. Mary had family around her and she had her child in a warm home surrounded by people that loved her. I know the empty shack with no door looks better on a Christmas card. But I want to tell you the truth. And this is what I want to address when we talk about this series. I think so often the Christmas story is filled with all of these fanciful details that tend to make the story kind of out of reach and out of touch. And we don't, we don't connect to it on a real level. This is a true story. This is not a fairy tale. We only have a handful of verses that describe Christmas. And I would so much rather the world hear the story that is there, not the story that isn't. Because the story that's here is about a king. The prophecy in Micah says, But you, O Bethlehem, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me the one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. Micah's prophecy says that a ruler of Israel is coming, coming to Bethlehem. That's the Christmas story. But the ironic thing is, at this time, Israel already has a ruler. In fact, it has two. It has the king of the Jews, that would be Herod, and it has the self-proclaimed man-god of the Roman Empire, Caesar Augustus. And Luke begins chapter two with Caesar, pushing his weight around. He's showing people, hey, I'm the boss. See, I can, I can move you all around like chess pieces. But see, just because somebody says they're a king or says they're a god doesn't make it true. Because as far as the Jews were concerned, they still had these words of Micah floating around in their head. They still knew prophecy and they still knew that a true king was coming. A deliverer, a Messiah was coming. That small baby in the manger was the glory that touched earth. It was the hope of the world. And he was the answer to a thousand prayers. And the truth of Christmas was Caesar Augustus was ruling, he was providing the people with tons of great things like government and roads and currency, but his rule and his lordship was just as fictional as the donkey Mary rode in on. And here's what I want you to understand. Removing the donkey, removing the stable, when we take those away from the story, it doesn't cheapen the Christmas miracle one bit because that is not the focus. The angel tells Mary, Jesus will be great and called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. Friends, the truth of the Christmas story isn't a stable. It's a king. And I think that today the story still asks us that question, who is your king? Who do you worship? You know, when I was growing up, do you want to know the Christmas present that I wanted more than anything in the world? I can't remember. <laughs> I, it's, it's true. I'm sure I wanted something. Right? I'm sure I wanted something more than anything. I'm sure I wanted it more than anything. I'm sure I prayed about it. I'm sure I cried about it. I'm sure I obsessed about it. 
I'm sure it was the one thing that I thought about. I'm sure it's the one thing that ruled my life. But you know what happened when I got it? I started looking for something else. I started obsessing about something else. I let something else rule my life. For some reason, the need to submit to something doesn't go away. I have this driving force in me to follow something, to long after something with desire. Some of you, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. There is something, there is something that you would give your entire life for. You might not consciously think about it. You might not even admit it. But as people, we are instinctively hardwired to follow, to serve, to submit. Now, the Bible calls this worship. And I think worship is one of those church words. And we just associate it with singing. Say, oh yeah, worship, eh, that's singing. But the Bible talks about worship as a way of living, as a way of existing. Worship is about who you submit to. It's about what rules your life. And I think just like lights and tinsel can distract us from the reason for this holiday, the nativity scene can also overshadow the most important part, the king. Revelation 4 says, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. The Bible says that you and I, all of creation, was made for one purpose, to worship God. Romans 11 says, For from him and through him and to him all things are made. To him be glory forever. Everything came from him. All things move towards him. And in between the from and the to, all things move through him. All things have a God word movement. In other words, God created us for himself and he is moving us toward him himself. Colossians 1 says, all things were created by him and for him. The Bible says that we are made for God, and we express that in every aspect of our lives. That's worship. Now, you might be sitting there today and thinking to yourself, not me, I don't, I don't worship anything. Did you know that recent science research suggests that the world was created by sound waves? This is a studied discipline called sonolium science. Without ever intending to point to God, now science is starting to. One science journal says this, the early universe rang with the sound of countless cosmic bells. Those sound waves moved like ripples on the surface of a pond. And that is how the planets and stars were formed. We can hear the echoes of these sounds today. What if, what if the universe is not really about quarks and quasars or even the stars in the sky? What if this is all about a song? The good news the shepherds carried that day, the song that was on their hearts, it wasn't about a stable and it wasn't about a donkey. No, the song they sang was the same one that they heard the angels sing. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Merry Christmas. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this time. It is a time that we have set aside to give honor and praise and to say happy birthday to the Savior of the earth, to the King of our lives, to the Messiah sent from heaven, to the baby born in a manger. Lord, may Christmas be about Jesus, because the Christmas story is about Jesus. Let us strip away barns and donkeys and innkeepers and focus on what's important. Even as we strip away garland and tinsel and lights, let us focus on what's important the birth of the King, the birth of your Son, Jesus Christ, 
and glory came and touched the earth. That is what we sing about this season, and that is what the universe sings about every day. May we join in this beautiful song with the angels. May we also say glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. Of course, I'd love to let you know that we have services every single week. We have a 9.30 service, which is our traditional service. We sing hymns, we have a choir. And then our 11 o'clock service is also where we have our contemporary service. And we have a worship team, we have a children's program, we even have youth group. And I wanna let you know we're gonna have a choir concert on December 12th. December 12th, our choir has been practicing for months and months and months. We would love to have you come. It's at 10 a.m. December 12th, Sunday at 10 a.m., one service here in the sanctuary. Please join us for this wonderful Christmas celebration. I love you guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.